continuing where uh, QuickTime died and cut me off, um, we were just talking about how this major event occurred around 550 or so million years ago, um, which we refer to as the Cambrian Explosion. And it really was sort of a metaphorical explosion of life on Earth, a major increase in the diversity of organisms, a major increase in the number, the sheer number of unique, different types of organisms on the Earth. During this time, you also have the introduction of skeletons, both internal and external. Um, you have uh, plants on land, you have animals on land spreading very quickly, right? Insects to amphibians to ultimately mammals, birds, um, reptiles, those sorts of things. You've got lots of plant life on Earth that's expanding to include trees and forests and that sort of thing. So why did this explosion occur? There are some theories for it. There are no explanations as of yet, definitive explanations, but... One really popular theory is that sexual reproduction um, is a much more efficient way of reproducing um, and sexual reproduction during this time became a thing um, and so this allowed for the diversification of animals and plants to accelerate. You could also argue that there was this continued um, buildup of oxygen which allowed uh, in the atmosphere and in the oceans through photosynthesizing organisms, which allowed ultimately for the formation of carbonate skeletons and the introduction of skeletons to protect from sort of the natural elements allowed for rapid diversification of animals. Either way, um, you slice it, we went from very few individual organisms on the earth to multitudes and multitudes and multitudes. So I love this graph and I'm going to move my ugly face out of the way for a second um, and I'm going to try to explain this to you. So this is um, a circular graph here. So the center is the beginning um, of the timeline. Earth birth as you say, as we say. Nobody says that but I love it. Earth birth. Um, around 4.5 uh, billion years ago and then around 4 billion years ago, right? So each of these lines here corresponds to uh, an age um, in terms of millions of years ago. So 4,000 million years ago is 4 billion years ago. 3,000 million years ago is 3 billion years ago, etc., 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 right? So you've got Earth birth, and then if we're going out radially from Earth birth, then you have 4 billion years ago, the beginning of life right here, okay? Life on Earth. And then 3 billion years ago, which is this dotted line here, you have, you know, a couple of different species, um, not very many in, in, in the context of what we have now. Um, and this persists for billions and billions of years. So for 3 billion years ago, 2 billion years ago, still not many more species than when, when we originally started this endeavor 4 billion years ago, right? So that's 2 billion years that's gone by. That's almost half of Earth's entire history. Um, we have very few single-celled organisms living in the oceans uh, exclusively. And then one billion years ago, things are starting to diversify here, but then right here at about 550 million years ago, or 542 million years ago, we go from this many, right, organisms. So, like, the number of organisms is represented by the width of this thing, um, this slice. So we have very small, increasing, then we have about this many organisms right before the Cambrian explosion. Oops, sorry, right here, right? And then with the Cambrian explosion, you just go from, you know, this amount a billion years ago to this amount, you know, by the end of the Cambrian explosion. Almost... I guess just eyeballing it here, increasing the number of uh, organisms, the diversity of organisms on the earth by about five to ten times as many. And then it continues to explode to today, um, where you now have this whole outer edge are all the different species of organisms alive today. And you compare this to just before the Cambrian explosion right here, let's say 700 million years ago, it's... Um, significant. We'll say it's significant. But you will notice, however, that it hasn't been linear. It wasn't like the Cambrian explosion and then the number of organisms on Earth just kept increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing. There have been several events 
throughout Earth's history where the number of organisms contracted, the number of individual unique organisms uh, got smaller. Um, and these were known, these are known as mass extinction events. They're events that essentially put a, put a stop to the rapid expansion in the number of organisms for a temporary period of time. And there have been five of them, five mass extinctions. So before we talk about them, let's do just a backtrack a little bit and talk about the history of a uh, human understanding of species and extinctions. So um, here in the, in the global north, and um, you know, when we talk about our knowledge and understanding of species and evolution and that sort of thing, the story usually starts here, during the age of brutal colonization of the globe. So during the, um, you know, 14, 15, 16, um, and 17 hundreds, European colonizers are traveling around the world, colonizing um, all, of these, all of these continents, and they're running into and running across things which they have no explanation for. They don't know what they are. They're very unique. They're very curious to these, um, these European um, colonizers. And so they take them back to Europe and they put them in what are known as cabinets of curiosities or Wunderkammers or Kunstkammers. Um, we now would refer to these as natu natural history museums. Um, so these are essentially artifacts of life, skeletons, um, strange to European looking birds like peacocks, right? Brought back to Europe, put in these um, these museums, these cabinets of curiosities, which are usually like a wing of um, a wealthy person's palace. Um, and and it's the first time that folks in the global north are thinking about um, the range of species that exist across the world and that not all species live everywhere. You can't see all of the things in the world. Um, they're geographically disseminated and as we'll get to in a moment, they've also been temporally disseminated. So here's an example, for example, of Old Worm's Cabinet of Curiosities from Museum Wormianum in 1655. They're very, here's another, a very similar one from Naples in 1599, right? We're running across things like crocodiles and these skulls of, of dinosaurs and, and things that, 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 don't, that either don't exist in Europe or don't exist anywhere on the earth and they're being brought back to Europe by these colonizers and put in these what we would now call natural history museums. So here's a here's a quote from um, traveler George Christoph Stern's observations um, uh, in 1638 of these these curiosities as we'll call them. A white partridge, a goose which has grown in Scotland on a tree, a flying squirrel, another squirrel like a fish, all kinds of bright colored birds from India, a number of things changed into stone, aka fossilized, right? Amongst others, a piece of human flesh on a bone, gourds, olives, a piece of wood, an ape's head, a cheese, etc., all kinds of shells, the hand of a mermaid, the hand of a mummy, a very natural wax hand under glass, all kinds of precious stones, coins, a picture wrought in feathers, a small piece of wood from the cross of Christ, pictures in perspective of Henry the Fourth and Louis the Thirteenth of France, etc. So this, uh, these discoveries really um, upset a lot of European colonizers, actually, because they ascribed their beliefs of biology according to Aristotle's great chain of being. They didn't think of species in the way we think of species now. They thought of species how the church told them to think of species, which originated from Aristotle's great chain of being, which had the being at the top as God, followed by his angels and his demons. Then you have man and then animals and then plants and then minerals and then non-being uh, things, right? So you go from the being to the realm of the being to the realm of the becoming to the non-being. A very hierarchical, hierarchical um, organization of what we would consider life on earth. Here's a depiction uh, um, uh, of the great chain of being with God at the top, right? Sitting on his um, elaborate throne, of course. And then, um, and then uh, his angels and his demons and then man and then animals and then plants and then rocks. 
at the bottom. So the world is essentially designed by the creator more or less like clockwork. It's filled with his various creations and each creation has a place within the plan and within the hierarchy of the plan. And then along comes Linnaeus and Linnaeus um, who, who lived between 1707 and 1778 thought about biology on Earth, and during this time of collections um, from, from around the globe being brought back by colonizers to these cabinets of curiosities, he started to name individual species as being distinct from each other, though he still ascribed to the general idea of the great chain of beings. He didn't quite get all the way um, there. So even though he did start to delineate between different species and did um, make note that um, there were multitudes of species on the planet. He still argued that we must pursue the great chain of nature till we arrive at its origin. He's still stuck on this idea that there is this organized hierarchical great chain of being and we should begin to contemplate her operations in the human frame and from thence continue our researches through the various tribes of quadrupeds, birds, reptiles, fish, insects, and worms till we arrive at the vegetable creation. However, he did note in his book published in 1760 called Sexes of the Plants that plants and the components of plants are very similar to the components of animals. Namely, if we look at a flower, right, we can uh, think of parts of the flower as similar reproductive parts of the human uh, species, right? So you have... Um, the calyx is the bedchamber, <laughs> the corolla, the curtains, the filaments, the spermatic vessels, the anther, the testes, the testicles, the pollen is, of course, the sperm, the stigma, the stigma here at the top, is the vulva, the style here is the vagina, and then, of course, the german, the ovary, the pericarp, the fecundating ovary, and the seed, the ovum. So, in many ways, Plants are just like humans. They reproduce just like humans, right? The filaments, the spermatic vessels, the anther, the testes, and the pollen, the sperm, right? Likening them to human anatomy. Um, and so this is known as Linnaeus's sexual system of classification, whereas he looked at plants specifically in this 1760 book, and he classified them by basically how big their dicks were. Um, if they had big dicks, they were all kind of classified in the same um, uh, type of plan. If they had big, um, um, you know, ovaries, then they were classified in a different type of plant. If they had big uh, petals, then they were classified as a different type of band, so, plant. So everything was classified according to how they looked to Linnaeus's own human eye. So while his system um, did start to separate things and did start to note that species are distinct from each other, it was still hierarchical and nested. And so it's still kind of ascribed to the great chain of being where you have humans, um, which are related to mammals because of their glands, which are related to birds because they have digited limbs, which are related to fish because they have backbones, etc. So once he did all this, and he nested all of these species classifications in this hierarchy, he found it excruciatingly difficult, actually, to make this into a perfect great chain. It didn't make sense, and he kind of just gave up there. And then along comes, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to pronounce his name, Georges Leopold Chrétien Frédéric Dagobert Cuvier, who we're just going to call Cuvier. Um, Cuvier said, cool, Linnaeus, cool stuff. Uh, you're wrong. Um, I'm this little hotshot French guy um, who's in charge of one of these natural history museums, right? I'm a biologist and I'm, I know more than you. And I'm saying that actually instead of looking at um, the outside of what these plants look like, right? Do they have big um, pistons? Do they have um, large seeds, small seeds, big petals, small petals, whatever? Let's actually look at two things, the geologic record and the anatomy of these, of these plants and animals, the internal anatomy specifically, the things you can't necessarily see, like the inside of your ear instead of the outside of your ear. 
Um, Linnaeus specifically neglected internal parts, especially in classifying in animals, relying only on what he could see from the outside. Okay, so Cuvier was like, no, we got to look inside. So for example, Linnaeus looked at the ear. Cuvier said, let's look inside the ear and let's classify things that way. He also was drawing on this idea of geologic time, which was around the same time that famous geologists were starting to say, um, well, first of all, that geology was starting to become a science at all, and that famous scientists were, geologists were starting to say that the Earth was very old, um, and that it was formed over many, 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 many billions of years, and that we could see this in the rock. Okay, and Cuvier said, let's take that a, a step further, and let's think of um, uh, of how organisms could relate to this long passage of time. Unfortunately, so he did kind of throw away the notion of the great chain. He gave up on that. He said, There's, this can't possibly fit within any framework of classification of species. But he didn't go that final step that Darwin went, which is that evolution can explain pretty much everything of why there are different species. So uh, Cuvier didn't quite get there. And he said that organisms cannot evolve because of this perfect correlation of parts. They're well put together like machines. Um, but this means that you can discern, discern function from structure. So he was getting there. He just didn't quite get all the way. But he did understand that some species existed in certain time periods as shown in those rock layers and then didn't exist in other time periods, okay? Meaning, you know, for example, the woolly mammoth or the giant mastodon, which um, you will read about in, in, in your reading, um, couldn't possibly uh, exist anymore. That it existed in a certain time um, in Earth's history and then ceased existing. And so he, this is a quote um, from the early 1800s. Life, therefore, has often been disturbed on the earth, Cuvier said, by terrible events, calamities, or um, what I'm calling here catastrophes, um, which at their commencement have perhaps moved and overturned to a great depth the entire outer crust of the globe. Meaning he's seeing that there are some animals in certain parts of the rocks that are not in other parts, right? That there are some animals that cease to exist. For example, the American Mastodon, which was originally discovered, the bones were discovered by colonizers, brought back to Europe. Originally, it was thought to be an American elephant, but when there were no American elephants um, seen alive, it was determined that the Mastodon no longer was alive and was a victim of a catastrophe, right? Which we now would call maybe a mass extinction. Numberless living beings have been the victims of these catastrophes. Some have been destroyed by sudden inundations. Others have been laid dry in consequence of the bottom of the seas being instantaneously elevated, etc., etc., etc. Okay? And so Cuvier is saying, look, some species existed once before and then now no, no longer exist, and that they must have been destroyed by a catastrophe. So he wasn't quite there. Um, but the idea of catastrophes is basically the beginning of our understanding of extinction, okay? Cuvier, more quotes from Cuvier, the thread of operations is broken, nature has changed course, and none of the agents she employs today would have been sufficient to produce her former works. These things lived once and are gone. Cuvier didn't quite understand that the reason that they're gone is because they didn't keep up with evolution or they were impacted by a catastrophic environmental event, which they did not evolve quickly enough to adapt to new living environments, and so then they died. Cuvier is kind of saying, um, for whatever reason, nature stopped making this species and started making a new species, not really quite ascribing to the idea of evolution, but very firmly um, initiating the conversation of um, mass extinctions and catastrophes. So find the final point here Cuvier is very well known for, for asserting that creatures do in fact go extinct, but they do not evolve. So um, this was met with, uh, with uh, 
um, disbelief with a lot of resistance in, in Europe at the time. Because if creation was perfect and the world was static, how is it that creatures could have gone extinct? Fossils also present a real traditional a problem for traditional creationists. Um, for example, Noah's flood can really only account for so much. And so the Cuvier started open sort of the floodgates to um, dismissing the idea that life on Earth has anything to do with creation or, um, or that sort of thing. That life on Earth is old, has been around for a really long time, and as Darwin would later say, well, as Cuvier would say, life has gone extinct before, and as Darwin would later say, that's because of evolution. When you put the two of them together, we have a very complete understanding of the history of life on Earth. And so that brings us to our discussion of mass extinctions. Mass extinctions are, um, so all species go extinct at, um, at varying paces and um, timelines, but there have been several events, five in fact, which we would call mass extinctions, when a, a large number of species went extinct at the same geologic time, obviously not at the exact same instantaneous second, but you know, the same several hundred thousand years or even shorter um, than that. And so the first extinction event um, after the Cambrian explosion, so you can't really have a mass extinction unless you have a mass number of species. And so mass extinctions all came after the Cambrian um, explosion. So you have the Cambrian explosion here around 550 million years ago, and then about uh, you know, 450 million years ago or so, you have the first mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician um, eon. Then you have the late Devonian extinction. And then you have the largest mass extinction that we know of, the Permian extinction, the end Permian extinction here, about 250 million year, million years ago. Um, you have this, which is referred to in this chart as the end Guadalupian, end Permian. We typically just call it the Permian extinction. You have a smaller extinction at the end of the Triassic period, um, and then you have, of course, the most famous, probably well-known extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, which is the extinction of the dinosaurs. So the Permian extinction, right, as I mentioned, let's see, where can I, I'll go here. Uh, the Permian extinction here, the most catastrophic mass extinction in Earth's history about 250 million years ago, 95% of all species on Earth, gone. Um, but prior to that, the Ordovician, which is the first mass extinction, right, about 450 or so million years ago after the Cambrian explosion, did result in about 85% um, of species going extinct in a, in a very short period of time, probably caused by rapid global cooling and falling sea levels. The result of this, of course, is that coastal areas were absolutely decimated of species. And that a lot of the reason for that is that these chemical reactions were affected by this extreme cold event. We have the Devonian extinction, which is likely caused by an asteroid, and then again, rapid global cooling. The Permian extinction, which is caused probably by a combination of volcanic activity and increases in CO2 and, and a rapid global warming. Um, then we have the Triassic extinction, which was um, kind of mid-dinosaur period. And then, of course, we have the KT extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, which is the most famous extinction, and that's the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago caused by an asteroid impact and volcanic activity combining to result in falling sea levels and changes to environmental conditions. You have widespread fires, you have plants disrupted by global ash cloud, and what we would call a nuclear winter, a very abrupt um, short period of very cold temperatures due to um, obsc obscuring of the sun by the asteroid's impact. And that results in about 80% of all species um, going extinct. So as we've already sort of touched upon in these previous slides, there are kind of four things that would cause a mass extinction event. Um, impact events, which is an asteroid, right? Um, asteroid hitting the Earth. Volcanism, increased volcanism. You have tons of volcanic activity, which is causing a mass extinction and changing the environment and the sunlight that's reaching the surface, which changes which plants can grow and how warm it is, etc. This all can combine or be independent of significant global warming of cool or cooling, as we are experiencing now, global warming. And then also can be related but also distinct are um, changes to sea level, specifically falling sea level, which affects species that are living in coastal areas. Um, when, when the sea level drops, they have nowhere to go.
So um, as you're reading notes and as we're going to talk about at length today, um, human activities are probably resulting in a loss of biodiversity, which is um, producing the sixth mass extinction. So we have had five mass extinctions prior to this, and we are probably, unfortunately, sad as it is, in the midst of a sixth mass extinction due to hunting, overharvesting, deforestation, and desert desertification, which are leading to habitat loss, um, pollution, um, introduced in exotic species like um, weeds, and then climate change going forward, right? So before humans, we have measured that the, back, the background extinction rate was about 15 species per year. So absent any human impacts, about 15 or so species per year would go extinct just by natural processes. Today in tropical forests, the extinction rate has been measured at as high as 27,000 species per year, many of them small microbes and um, fungi and protists and, and other um, sort of highly specialized plants. Nevertheless, um, we are definitely experiencing what this study refers to as biological annihilation. So not only is it small species like microbes and bacteria, um, frogs as you'll see in the reading, um, or, or highly specialized plants, but it's now affecting large megafauna as we call them. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the problem of that. So we, we know, like, for example, cheetahs and giraffes and lions and orangutans especially are all going extinct. One reason why we focus on these types of species is because they're what we call charismatic or enigmatic species, which kind of distorts our understanding of mass extinctions, actually. Um, we're really focused on lions and orangutans and giraffes because... Um, we, they're charismatic and they're enigmatic and we can kind of relate to them. We can anthropomorphize them in a way that makes them sort of relatable to our human experience, okay? But they don't tell the whole story. These 27,000 species per year are not all lions and cheetahs. They're small species that we can't see that are not enigmatic, that are not charismatic, that we don't have a connection to, but actually may end up being ultimately more important in the survival of the global ecosystem. So these um, long-lived, large, low, product, low reproductive rate species are definitely very, very, very susceptible to extinction um, and will probably be the first to go, but are not always what we would call keystone species in that um, they may not actually end, bring about the end of various ecosystems like pandas and rhinos, but smaller species like bacteria and specialized grasses and other things could actually be what we would call keystone species or linchpins to which would ultimately lead to global collapse of sort of many of the globe's ecosystems. So we have a lot to think about, right? In terms of life, in terms of extinctions, in terms of all of these various things. So what do we have to think about here? Well, we've got to think about um, what is the environment and what are the environmental changes, right? How is How are these environmental changes by things out of our control and then things um, that are within our control and how will those changes affect species both large charismatic enigmatic species and also smaller um you know less uh sort of relatable less charismatic species what things will be left after the current extinction event and how quickly will the process of evolution change a species will coral for example be able to adapt to climate change these are all considerations that we've got to think about as we think about mass extinctions, the intersection of climate change, both now and in the past and in the future, and what we can do about it. And most importantly, or not most importantly, but also importantly to many people, can humans ourselves survive this mass extinction event? So there are two articles here, which I'm going to leave the links for here, but I'm going to introduce as part of the group work today during our Zoom. There's also a podcast here, which is going to be part of your individual group work um, for next week as well. And there's a link to um, just a PBS video on the dawn of humanity, which is related, but not exactly like um, integral to our discussion, but I think is like a really fun video to watch. It's really interesting for folks who are interested in it. Um, and so on that note, right? as we talk about mass extinctions, as we think about um, uh, 
the the, the future uh, of our planet and, and 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 the role of humans in shaping that future, we've got to think about how humans have existed on the Earth. So humans, of course, evolved and 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 sort of began their their conquest of the planet um, in Eastern Africa, um, right here, around um, around two hundred thousand years ago. Modern anatomically modern Homo sapiens first arrived on the scene, so to speak, and around sixty five thousand years ago or so, they began to migrate. They began to leave Africa through two routes: through the southern route and through the northern route. The northern route took them to Europe and points beyond about 40,000 years ago. The southern route took them through both India and South and Southeast Asia, all the way to East Asia and China, what we would now call China, by 50,000 years ago, and similarly through Indonesia and into Australia, also by 50,000 years ago. It wasn't until about 16,000 years ago that humans first crossed this land bridge um, that connected uh, northern Russia to northern Alaska, and then within a thousand or so years, they uh, migrated all the way from northern Alaska all the way to the southern tip of South America. Oops. It was during this migration that humans caused a mini mass extinction, um, which is actually what this podcast is about and which your group work today is going to be about, which I will introduce more of in the Zoom. So the reason for this mass extinction is likely because Plants and animals here evolved um, for a long period of time without the presence of humans. And then, abruptly, 16,000 years ago, humans arrived on the scene, and then within a thousand years had essentially um, settled on the entire North and South American continents. It was this abrupt settlement that caused the extinction of many large animals like the mammoth, right? The saber-toothed tiger, if any of you have been to the La Brea Tar Pits in LA, you've seen some of these, um, these fossils and bones and skeletons. This is a, a smaller scale mass extinction. It doesn't register on the global scale, um, but it's something that was probably caused by humans and also um, an important sort of warning sign for the sixth mass extinction that we're in today. And so we're going to uh, listen to this podcast and then do some group, uh, do some group analyses on that as part of your work for this week. So that concludes this lecture on life and mass extinctions and, and our understanding of that. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, make sure that you've got your questions and uh, we'll answer them in the Zoom and talk about um, where we go from here. All right, thank you guys.